it's high time I got back to a solid state project and I've had uh, some ideas for what we could start 2024 off on with solid state and I think that a double sideband QRP transceiver would be a good way to kick things off. Now double sideband has been the darling of the beginner uh, phone type experimenter. So building a double sideband type transmitter, exciter, or uh, a transceiver as we're going to try to do is nothing new. Doing it in solid state is easier than ever using techniques really from the 70s. And uh, a lot of the foundational uh, material for this project will be from the 70s. You might think that uh, a box like this with a little transceiver would be fairly simple to uh, put together, but just because something's solid state doesn't mean it's easier. There are rules that we have to follow and the circuits are a little more complex with solid state. But uh, let's start out with a little bit of double sideband theory and mythology. Double sideband suppressed carrier is basically amplitude modulation without the carrier. It's one form of AM, as is single sideband. You may remember that regular AM sends the carrier along with the sidebands, which is handy since the carrier automatically arrives at the receiver properly to allow demodulation with either an envelope detector or a product detector. You can manually zero beat and you get the audio. Double sideband does not, however, send that carrier along, thus saving power, so you essentially get 50% efficiency with DSB. So before we talk about double sideband, we're going to have to talk about standard AM. In standard high-level AM, the carrier and both sidebands are transmitted. When the carrier is fully modulated, let's say 100%, the efficiency of an AM transmission is defined as the power in the sidebands divided by the total power times 100%. So for 100 watts of AM, sine wave power modulated, we could say 50 watts are in the carrier and 25 watts are on each sideband. During the modulation process, the carrier power remains constant. It's only needed really as a reference during the demod process in a standard AM detector. This means that the sideband power is the only useful section of the signal information-wise. And this corresponds to 50 over 100 or 50% of the total power transmitted. So this 50% efficiency really is over modulation when it comes to AM because you'd have to go below zero to achieve it. So that means distortion on the receive end. So practically for a 100% modulated AM signal, we only get a 33% efficiency. Again, the efficiency of the power expended to produce useful information is only 33% for high level plate AM. The first logical approach is to reduce the carrier to a pilot tone that can re reproduce the carrier at the receive through some kind of a phase lock loop. We call this a synchronous detector. It works great and you get upwards of 40 to 50 percent efficiency with a system like this, but it's quite a complex receiver. Next, let's just lop off one of the sidebands. This is kind of what your ICOM 706 does. We call this single sideband AM. You do get some theoretical efficiency improvement over standard AM, but on the receive side, sometimes people can say you sound a little bit weak. Then we have double sideband. This is typically 50% efficient because we have no carrier at all. Finally, we have single sideband, which is using the same idea, getting rid of the carrier, but it comes out to 100% efficiency because all of the power is devoted to one single sideband. Before I get too far into this, I just want to let you know that double sideband modulation is nothing new. It's something that was done in the early days of single sideband for people that either wanted to try sideband and not spend a fortune, or just to be able to experiment on the bench and make a rig where you could talk to other people using single sideband. So these circuits go way back to the 50s and 60s and high level double sideband modulation was the way they did it most of the time, either modulating 
the cathodes or the screens of the final tubes in such a way that you're developing a single balanced high level mixer. And early attempts at solid state double sideband are not new either. Here's one from 1971 and he claims about 40 dB of carrier suppression with just four transistors. So how do you make DSP? Well, you first have to start with standard AM. Make AM through any of the processes you know. Analog multiplication, nonlinear junction mixing, sometimes called product modulation, choppers or commutation, high-level mixing or modulation, like standard high-level plate. Okay, so now we have AM. How do we get rid of the carrier? Well, we can filter it out. When we make single sideband, our filter takes out as much as 20 dB of carrier. We could just make a sharp band reject trap and filter out the carrier. Sounds a little bit difficult, though. The way it's done typically is through phasing or a balanced structure that mathematically removes the carrier. We call these balanced mixers. They come in singly and doubly balanced versions and they use all the same components to make AM, like transistors, FETs, diodes, Gilbert cells, but they all do the same thing. They are standard AM modulators that have been cleverly put together with a phasing trick to remove the carrier. The diode ring modulator has the carrier signal suppressed because the sum and the difference of the input frequency of the carrier uh, is simply canceled out by phasing. Okay, here's a double sideband signal. This is a 1 kilohertz tone. I'm demodulating it with the lower sideband filter. If I go to upper sideband, I'm also demodulating no problem, but notice the frequency is a little different. I could fool around with this frequency and try to get it to be the same as the lower sideband. But it wouldn't take long before the two of them were out of phase, out of frequency, and it's just difficult to get a perfect USB to LSB demodulated tone. And that presents the problem with trying to demodulate with a DSB type detector, because if the two are only off by a few hertz, they start to cause distortion with one another. Now to aid this, you can go to synchronous demodulation. This is an AM demodulator. That's kind of working. It's distorted because it doesn't have enough carrier. Synchronous AM, however, reinserts the carrier perfectly and you'll notice not only is there less distortion, but the audio has gone up significantly. There's more recovered audio with the synchronous AM detector. DSB is best received with a synchronous AM detector. You're going to get more audio and you're going to have less distortion. But of course, this goes against our very simple beginner's type project. Adding a phase lock loop and making the VFO or the VXO into a VCO is a little more work than we want to do with a simple transceiver. So first of all, the depth of null that you get with a double sideband modulator which is really either a doubly balanced or a singly balanced mixer. And I'm using a singly balanced two diode mixer. It's a very common way to make double sideband. If I attach the modulation, you'll see that uh, we get a nice tone out. If I push the button on my little circuit, I'm unbalancing the balance modulator by putting DC into it and you can see that we're achieving probably a little bit over 60 dB of carrier rejection. 
That's very difficult to do on a simple circuit board. When you have a simple circuit board, it's difficult to achieve enough isolation between the stages to actually see anything close to 60 dB. So I've gone really crazy with this uh, demonstrator board to show you that it actually can be done. So what does double sideband look like uh, when you are modulating? That's interesting to people. Let's uh, attach the modulation source. That's the classic DSB pattern that you'll see on your scope. Developing uh, single sideband and double sideband type equipment uh, requires some manner of test equipment that can get you to the end without uh, causing you to go crazy. I do not have sophisticated equipment in the shack. My best piece of equipment is actually this receiver. Think of it as a frequency selective voltmeter. It has a strong front end and it's tunable and it can do multi-modes. To me, that's kind of like having a test instrument that can critically look at um, some of the parameters we're interested in, like carrier depth once we do the, the null. Uh, the scope, of course, provides a picture of the modulation, and we can get a trapezoid pattern as well as uh, time domain patterns. But really, you need better equipment than what I'm showing to do the development work. Now, if you've got a kit or you're putting together something that's already tested, you stand a much better chance. However, most experimenters wink at all of this, simply put something on the board, and if they see 20 or 30 dB of... Uh, depth in the carrier rejection. They're happy and they go on the air. So I wanted to make a double sideband modulator that I could use on the bench as an evaluation circuit. I happen to have a couple of those CMOS clock modules. Uh, this one was right in band at 28.5 megahertz. It seemed to be TTL and it was biased at half VCC or about 2.5 volts. And it seemed happy to drive a 2K load. So rather than trying to use it as is and run it into some type of a 50 ohm input on my modulator, I added a emitter follower, a 2N2222, but any NPN transistor can do this job. I didn't even need to really touch the biasing. I had a 12 volt rail and it just simply biased itself and I got a nice looking uh, waveform on the output. So I made myself a tri-filer wound transformer, seven turns, and uh, that worked out very nicely to drive a couple of uh, Shockey diodes. I had these 5711s in the box so I used them. Uh, the nulling pot could be anything from 50 ohms to probably 500 ohms and it would work okay. A multi-turn pot, trim pot would be better than uh, what I'm using. I also added a unbalance feature where I can put 12 volts into the uh, balance modulator and upset it to the point where you get full carrier output. Uh, on the uh, output uh, I have a pad that just meant sure, made sure that I had a 50 ohm match on the output as well and stabilized it. Uh, the addition of the nulling capacitor C9 uh, really helped the, uh, the null. And uh, what this schematic does not show is how much care I had to take outside of the circuit board. I had to use really good quality cable to the receiver. I put some inline attenuation uh, about uh, 20 dB of attenuation in line and also uh, made sure that everything was well bypassed and uh, laid everything out on the circuit so that we go from left to right without uh, causing trouble. I was able to realize with no real shielding in place other than the board itself uh, greater than 60 dB of carrier rejection so I was very happy with this. Now of course there's no amplification on the board and the outputs around minus 20 dBm.